Good morning, good evening, good day, everyone. A warm welcome to all the participants that are joining the next part of the Fair Digital Finance Forum by Consumers International. Today, our session bears the title Protecting and Empowering Vulnerable Consumers in the Digital Financial or Finance Marketplace. And I'm very pleased to have a small but excellent panel here in our, um, in our session today. For everyone who is joining, please use the chat function here in Zoom also to introduce yourself with name and organization affiliation so that everybody knows a little bit who is attending. And also feel free to use that function if you have questions because after the panelist interventions, will of course go over to a question and answers and you will be encouraged also to ask questions to our panelists. So I see that some people are already using that function. That is fantastic. And I hope everyone already was able to join. We're very much on time. I am German. That is more a German feature, actually, to be so much on time. But I hope that everybody can join slowly but surely so that we make the best out of the time that we have. Maybe the dedicated CI team exactly could put up the next slide. Fantastic. So this is today's topic, and I will be delighted to quickly introduce who we are and you, who you are going to be able to listen to today. So my name is Isabel Busco. Um, I work for the Federation of German Consumer Organizations, which is, of course, a member of Consumers International. I have a special role in my organization because I'm not based in Berlin with all the other colleagues, but I run a small team in Brussels, Belgium, where all the European Union institutions are hosted. So my job normally is to advocate for better European Union laws for consumers. Next slide, please. And these are our panelists today. So first, we will have the intervention by Matthew Sosorian. And Matthew Sosorian works for the OECD and he will provide us with an overview drawing on recent research conducted by the OECD. Next will be Martin Grimwood, who works for Ipsos Mori. Um, you may know that this is a research institute. And Martin is a senior client officer with Ipsos Financial Services team in the United Kingdom in Europe. He has over 30 years of market research and consultancy experience, and he will share that experience with us today. And last but not least, my fellow consumer advocate colleague, Anna Echenique from the Spanish so also European consumer organization, THECU. And as the vice president of THECU, which she joined in the year 2000. So you can see there's quite a lot of consumer experience here in the virtual room. And I think with no further delay, we should probably get started. Fantastic, yes. thank you, Isabel. Thank you for that introduction. Um, uh, again, my name is Matthew Strasorian. I'm uh, calling from the OECD in Paris, and I'm really looking forward to this discussion. And thank you for, again, for inviting us to participate. Um, so just by way of context, um, the OECD as an organization uh, leads international financial consumer protection policy and coordination. And this is carried out uh, primarily through the G20 OECD Task Force on Financial Consumer Protection, which was established as part of the response to the global financial crisis. And its members represent policymakers from all G20 and OECD countries, as well as international organizations. And the task force is responsible for implementing and maintaining the G20 OECD high level principles on financial consumer protection. Um, and my colleague, uh, Anna, will be speaking more about these principles at a session uh, tomorrow. Uh, they are currently undergoing a review, a 10-year strategic review, and I just want to uh, take a moment to thank Consumers International and your members for participating and providing inputs into this review. Uh, so today, I'm going to be speaking about some research. Uh, you can go back to the 
It's okay. You can keep it on that slide, actually. Uh, to be speaking about enhanced protections uh, for consumers who are experiencing uh, vulnerability. So my presentation will start a little bit theoretical and then go into specific examples. Um, so just to say that enhanced protections for consumers who may be vulnerable are an important part of many financial consumer protection regimes around the world. Um, consumer vulnerability can, however, take different forms, and it can be applicable in different circumstances. And this requires a nuanced understanding and approach to the subject. And the experience of COVID-19 and all of its effects have particularly highlighted the ways in which consumers may experience vulnerability or may be vulnerable, including those who may not have traditionally been considered as such. Okay, you can move on to the next slide. Thank you. So to start with, as I said, uh, for our research, I started by looking at the academic literature um, on how they've conceptualized consumer vulnerability, because academics from various fields, including psychology, economics, sociology, and marketing, have studied consumer vulnerability, and they've developed different definitions and conceptions of this topic. So broadly speaking, uh, these definitions generally include these three dimensions that you can see on the slide. So on the first, uh, the first bucket is individual characteristics, such as someone's age, their sex, uh, any disabilities they may be living with, um, their ethnicity, their socioeconomic status. And then we move into individual circumstances, which could be something that someone is experiencing, such as uh, going through a grief or mourning, uh, going through a divorce, uh, losing a job. And then there are external conditions such as things in the market or in the society where these consumers uh, exist, such as inequality or discrimination or lack of access to services. Um, and so essentially these three dimensions interact to produce situations where consumers may experience vulnerability. Uh, you can move to the next slide, please. Thank you. So I just wanna note that uh, vulnerability is very much tied to other concepts that we talk a lot about, such as disadvantage and discrimination, and also financial hardship. But I just want to take a second to share some of the thinking that, that we've done and that we've come across in the literature about how these different concepts are linked, but they are still distinct issues with different implications for policymakers and for firms. So vulnerability is typically thought of as the susceptibility to harm rather than the actual experience of financial harm or financial hardship or detriment. So in other words, vulnerability is the risk of falling into hardship, but it's not necessarily the ongoing situation of living in a certain state of poverty or need. So using this definition, then anyone, regardless of wealth or income, can be vulnerable. And this is a view that it was supported by many jurisdictions and many people's experiences during the COVID-19 pandemic. And then secondly, vulnerability is also of course linked to discrimination and disadvantage, but it's not exactly the same thing and it diverges from these concepts in important ways. So for example, uh, some of the research that we came across uh, explained that disadvantaged groups are disadvantaged because they are unequal, they're worse off than others in a specified context. And vulnerable groups are vulnerable not solely because of a particular characteristic that they share, but because they are subject to harm by marketers or firms. So not everyone who experiences disadvantage might be vulnerable or open to harm, but all vulnerable consumers are by definition open to harm. So following this logic, being quote unquote vulnerable is not something that is permanently attached to consumers who all share a certain characteristic. So in this sense, then the term vulnerable consumer might maybe shouldn't be used synonymously or used interchangeably with certain groups, such as women, youth, uh, people living on low incomes, ethnic minorities, the elderly, et cetera. So belonging to a certain category doesn't in itself make a vulnerable consumer doesn't make a consumer vulnerable. Um, for example, the elderly, the elderly are not vulnerable simply because they are old, but they are vulnerable when they are susceptible to marketplace harm. Now, at the same time, I do wanna emphasize that, of course, certain groups of consumers or certain characteristics um, make people more likely to experience vulnerability. 
Um, and this, these characteristics or these circumstances might differ across different jurisdictions or um, different markets, different countries, but we all are aware of um, uh, different characteristics or circumstances that can make someone more vulnerable. So in one study, for example, actually from the OECD, looking at the, the US and looking at consumers in the United States, the authors find that Black and African Americans and Hispanics uh, are more likely to be financially vulnerable than uh, compared to non-Hispanic white Americans. And uh, furthermore, things such as your education level, work status, and net worth also correlate with household financial vulnerability. Uh, next slide, please. So moving on from the sort of academic conceptual world, now moving into the government, what governments and regulatory authorities are doing, um, they also have developed their own definitions of vulnerability for vulnerable consumers for the purposes of targeting enhanced consumer protections. So the examples here on this slide, um, these are drawn from different legal or uh, regulatory definitions. Um, and these come from the financial services sector, but it's important to note as well that this concept of vulnerability or vulnerable consumers also arises in many other retail sectors, um, such as the energy sector, telecommunications, food, or healthcare. And you can see here on this slide that there, there is a lot of overlap with um, the, or, or it, it um, aligns with the general idea of looking at individual characteristics, looking at individual circumstances, and then how those interact with external circumstances or external factors to produce um, vulnerability. So the next slide, I will just wrap up, um, uh, given my time is, is coming to a close, with some examples from the financial sector of how different governments or regulatory authorities have not only defined vulnerability, but then also implemented guidance or requirements for how uh, firms, uh, banks, financial services providers should address vulnerability and treat vulnerable consumers. And as we know, again, going back to COVID-19, we know that throughout the pandemic, many jurisdictions implemented specific relief programs for consumers who were uh, vulnerable, who were made vulnerable, or who were experiencing financial hardship as a result of the pandemic. So quickly, before I wrap up, I'll just highlight two examples here, um, just because they, they kind of capture the, the idea. So in France, for example, there are regulations that limit the amount of fees that can be charged to quote unquote financially fragile um, consumers if they do things such as overdraw their account or if there are payment irregularities in their accounts. And then once a consumer is, is identified as being vulnerable or being fragile, then banks have to offer a specific offer for these clients. And that offer kind of has a basic package of services. It has a monthly fee that's limited. And then they're on top of that, there are capped fees. And then quickly, just in Brazil, um, similarly, they require supervised entities to account for vulnerable populations. And rather than defining vulnerability by the, the central bank, the, the, these entities are required to develop their own methodologies to analyze customers and then identify them according to different grades of vulnerability. And then once doing that, then they have to make sure that they meet the needs of those customers uh, with appropriate products and services. So I'll finish there. Um, thank you again for inviting us and really looking forward to the rest of the conversation. Thank you so much, Matt. Yes, I'm sure there will be further questions uh, addressed to you. And you were extremely quick um, in, in taking over. So I'll just highlight a few things that I had prepared for my intro. And I think it, it fits neatly into what you said, because you highlighted a lot also on what has been happening since the pandemic hit. But uh, from a European perspective, we can see that in 2016 already, the European Commission published a study about consumer vulnerability. And I can tell you, it's rather a thick board. Um, and in its section on financial services, it reads, and I quote, the financial services sector is a highly complex environment where many consumers could be seen as vulnerable, including those that would be labeled as sophisticated consumers. In other sectors, in this vein, it's important to highlight that all the consumers are a highly heterogeneous group. The vulnerability drivers specific to the financial sector are cross-cutting 
in that they apply to a very wide range of consumers. However, some consumer groups have nevertheless been identified as being more at risk of becoming vulnerable than others. The feature setting the financial services sector apart from other key sectors examined in this study relates to the high monetary costs and significant potential detriment to well-being that suboptimal financial decisions may cause to individual consumers and also to the economy as a whole. Then they refer a little bit to the 2008 crisis so that you can see that they draw on slightly different framework at the time. Um, but it's important to keep that in mind if we speak not only about vulnerability as an individual feature, but that it is highlighted that it is more a framework here that needs to be set in the right way. And some parts of the report draw on an analysis from the British member of Consumers International, which who at the time produced a report about consumer vulnerability in financial markets that certainly highlights also the importance of having consumer groups involved in those regulatory analysis. So although from 2016, this report is an excellent reminder, I think, uh, of the urgency of the challenge to protect vulnerable consumers in the marketplace and the importance of consumer advocacy and collaboration among stakeholders. And that's what we will hear from our two next panelists. So first, I'd like to hear a bit and understand a bit better the current regulatory landscape. Um, and that will be presented by Martin Grimwood from Ipsos Mori, who will deep dive us a little bit into the UK scenario. So you will provide us with a deep dive into the UK case. We will learn about the Financial Conduct Authority's approach to vulnerability and what providers can do individually to ensure there are positive outcomes for consumers. So Martin, the floor is yours. Thank you, Isabel. Um, for those of you who don't know Ipsos, we're a global insight and consultancy firm. Um, we're headquartered in Paris with um, H9 um, countries, oh, sorry, offices in countries. So that gives us a, a unique um, view of financial services across the world. Uh, I work in the financial services team in the UK. I'm a senior account director with some of the largest um, UK banks, as well as the financial services regulator, the FCA. So hopefully that puts me in a unique position to talk about how the regulator is working to protect customers in the UK and how the banks are implementing the guidance they receive from the regulator. Can we go on to the next slide, please? So it's fair to say that protection of vulnerable customers in the UK has evolved over time. So I'm gonna take you through on this page, um, a quick overview of um, how that has evolved and, and the changes the FCA have made to, to beef up their protection for consumers. So the FCA regulation is based on six principles. The sixth principle is a starting point for vulnerability regulation that we have today. So that is that a firm must pay due regard to the interests of its customers and treat them fairly. So in 2006, to, to support this sixth principle, the FCA launched Treating Customers Fairly. And through Treating Customers Fairly, they laid out what they expected from firms in terms of outcomes for their customers if they were to be treated fairly. Now, it's fair to say that Treating Customers Fairly had some impact, but it didn't have the teeth to make that big difference. And some of the issues that Matthew referred to are the backdrop to why that didn't um, happen. Moving on to 2012, which is arguably one of the biggest shakeups in um, the UK distribution of financial services, the FCA launched Retail Distribution Review, which really focused on the sale of investment products in three ways. Firstly, they banned the commission-based uh, commission sales to ensure financial advisors were not influenced by how much commission they could make on a sale. They also required advisors to gain qualifications in order to give advice. And I suppose more importantly, they, they threatened the banks with big fines for mis-selling. So we started to see um, in the um, 2012, um, really the, the, the FCA um, penalizing banks who were seen not to treat customers fairly. And the, the game changer really in terms of vulnerability happened just last year 
after a long cons consultation period where the FCA launched vulnerability guidance. So with vulnerability guidance, the FCA set out detailed requirements for firms to protect vulnerable customers with penalties for non-adherence. And I'm gonna focus on this over the next few slides. Um, what we've seen though, even in the last 12 months is that the FCA have taken vulnerability guidance and created customer care, which cr creates even more accountability in the UK. And this is still under the consultation stage. Because we're here to talk about fair digital finance, I thought it'd be worthwhile also mentioning a, a sidecar that took place during this period called the FinTech Sandbox. So the FCA recognized the benefits of FinTechs to the market, um, arguing that increased competition would lead to better customer outcomes. So they set up an, a sandbox so that FinTech could play and build and test propositions with regulatory oversight. So arguably the fintech that are coming to market now have benefited from that so that they are, have TCF principles built in. If we go on to the next slide, please, um, we'll just take you through what those FCA vulnerability guidance um, requirements are. So there are four requirements. The first one is to understand the needs of vulnerable customers. So firms have to identify the drivers of vulnerability for their sector. And this applies, this requirement applies to all financial services firms, whether they're banks, insurers, um, investment companies, effectively, if they're regulated by the FCA. So the, the, the differences across the sector need to be taken into account. Once firms have identified vulnerable customers, they need to understand the input, impact of their products and services on those vulnerable customers and anticipate, anticipate the outcomes of any interaction those vulnerable customers have with them. Once they've done that, they need to make sure that there is a cultural change within the firm, that training and empowerment, empowerment takes place so that vulnerable customers' um, needs are met both in terms of the product development, but also the front line staff who interact with customers on a regular basis. Which leads us to the third practical action, which is that they need to respond to vulnerable customers through everything they do, product design, customer service, and communications. So a good example of this is during the pandemic, how banks were able to flex, especially on loan products, to allow some vulnerable customers, probably those individuals who'd uh, been furloughed during the pandemic to take repayment holidays on loans. That's the kind of um, initiative that the bank, that the FCA are looking to the banks to put into place. The firms then need to constantly monitor and develop to ensure that the outcomes of vulnerable customers are similar to the outcomes of non-vulnerable. But I suppose the million dollar question that the bank's task and, and other financial services providers in the UK is, well, what constitutes vulnerability? What's the definition? How can we identify them? So if we go on to the next slide, please, um, I'll put a, a very familiar um, picture up of um, Where's Wally? And I suppose as banks who started to look at the guidance from the FCA felt just like this. Um, there are so many frameworks of vulnerability. If you just Google vulnerability frameworks, uh, hundreds will, will appear. So the FCA were very specific in terms of identifying what vulnerability means to them in financial services. Now, there is a challenge here for financial services providers because they were doing a lot already to protect vulnerable customers before financial guidance was launched by the FCA. And that's partly because of legislation, such as provision for customers with disabilities, and also simply because it's the right thing to do. So um, purposeful bank banks were um, already focusing on these issues. However, what we saw from the FCA was that their definition of vulnerability, and it's something that echoes through Matt's earlier presentation, is a lot wider than the banks had anticipated. So they defined vulnerability very carefully to avoid ambiguity, to create consistency, and to create conformity across the industry. So if we go to the next slide, please, I'll just take you through what that looks like in terms of defining vulnerable customers based on FCA guidance in the UK at the moment. So FCA vulnerability is based on four key drivers um, shown on the right-hand side. Firstly, 
we have health, which covers illness, which impacts on a customer's ability to carry out day-to-day -day tasks. So that's including things like sight and hearing impairments, but also mental health issues. We also have low financial capability, which covers low knowledge of financial matters or confidence in managing money. We also have negative life events. So these are major life events, such as bereavement or breakdown of relationships or redundancies. And the largest group is low financial resilience. And this is the ability to withstand emotional or financial shocks. What you'll notice um, from the sum of all the drivers on the right-hand side is that they're greater than the overall vulnerability figure we show here. And this is because of the intersectionality of vulnerability. So for example, you may have low financial resilience because you have experienced a negative life event. And that's something that Matthew mentioned earlier in terms of the um, work that he'd done across other frameworks. But one of the key things about the drivers is that they, um, some can be determined in advance, for example, low financial capability or disability. So the bank could um, arguably identify low financial capability through the data they hold on a customer, whilst others might happen in the future, such as a negative life event. And again, that's something that Matthew picked up on in his earlier presentation. So what the FCA are requiring firms to do is to anticipate both. Now, if you look at the, the stats on the slide, these are generated from research that the um, Ipsos does for um, our clients in the UK. And what we've done is replicated the research that um, the FCA have done through Financial Lives to get to those numbers. So digital inclusion here isn't actually included in the definition, but what we know through the analysis that we've done is that um, vulnerable customers are more than twice as likely to be digitally excluded than non-vulnerable, which is something that needs to be taken into account when we talk about fin uh, digital finance. What I'm going to do is just close on a few stats to, to focus on digital exclusion to give you an idea of how prevalent that is in the world and in the UK. So next slide, please. Looking at um, data generated um, prior to the pandemic, it's clear that uh, only uh, that 37% that of the world's population is not using the internet. So in effect, they're digitally excluded. If you go on to the next slide, please. In the UK, which arguably is an advanced um, country in terms of access to um, mobile and um, PC-based um, internet, um, around a fifth of the UK population claim not to have the necessary digital skills to set up simple bank accounts online. And that becomes a problem when offline, offline brands suddenly shift to online only distribution channels. So on the right hand side, we can see here a, a manifestation of that um, taken from last week's Guardian, um, one of the um, broadsheet newspapers in the UK, where we can see a letter to the Guardian's financial um, agony ant, where a customer who was previously comfortable with online banking has now been, been forced to move to an app based um, solution, which they, they cannot access. So for the offline traditional banking organizations, it does pose a huge problem as they move towards um, online um, distribution of services. And it also pro 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 provides a significant problem for the regulator um, where they're trying to apply a one-size-fits-all regulation um, for digital finance. So can you allow digital um, only brands that are launching just to offer digital and then decline that to the traditional banks. Well, on my final slide, I wanted to leave with a positive um, point here that digital um, can be a, an inclusivity game changer. And this is data that I've um, stolen with pride from one of my colleagues in Latin America, whereby she's been looking at um, the financial inclusion index for Latin America, where we can see that there's a significant proportion of Latin America, which is unbanked with very low financial inclusion stats. And what we've seen there is that the growth of um, digital only brands, which are actually opening up for the first time or democratizing um, payment systems for the unbanked, such as Mercado Pago, 
new Q and new. So I, I'll hand over to you, Isabel, again, um, sorry for overrunning. Hopefully that's given you an idea of the landscape for um, regulation in the UK, but also a little deeper insight into the, the, the challenges for digital inclusion. Thank you very much, Martin. It has indeed, and I'm grateful for your last slide to have included also a little perspective from another part of the world because we're a bit um, developed economy centric, if I may say, on, on our panel. So I would like to already encourage uh, colleagues and participants here that follow us um, to prepare their questions that they can ask to the panelists in a moment. Once we have listened to our final panelist, who is Anna Echenik from the Spanish consumer organization, FECU. And I think Anna, the closing words of Martin are actually a good starting point for you also, because we've been discussing a lot vulnerability in financial markets, generally speaking now and vulnerability, generally speaking. But this specific angle of financial services and financial markets moving to the digital world and the digital only is, of course, a specific challenge. And I'm very curious to hear what you have to report from your experience in Spain, and then later on, maybe some colleagues also from other places in the world. Anna, the floor is yours. Anna, wait, your microphone is muted. We cannot hear you yet. Excuse me, excuse me. Perfect. Yes, well, thanks. Thanks a lot for inviting me here because in these meetings, the most important part is learning. And to listen to Matthew and to Martin has been very important. So now I'm going to start with a sentence, with a, a statement that um, uh, Carlos San Juan de la Orden, an 80-year-old retired surgeon, uh, said in a newspaper, and it was, I am an old man, but I'm not an idiot. So this uh, statement came in the exact moment because everyone, it's a critical point of discontent and even we can say anger with the banks and the uh, financial services. Uh, I think that not only elderly people, but everyone is left out. It's uncomfortable. It's very different from what it was a short time ago. And now digital accessibility should have been friendly and should have been thought, uh, should have been designed thinking on the needs of people. But I don't know what happens that it comes, it's always up down. Someone designs something and we have to accept it instead of starting down up to see exactly what we need. And interfaces, applications and programs are not friendly. And you can realize it anytime you go out of your ambit, your your day to day work. When you go out of that, it's not friendly, really. It's not easy. And this happens, I think we can extrapolate uh, elderly to whatever vulnerable uh, risk or situation uh, that have been described before. Uh, it's a pity because this last generation technology has resulted more an obstacle than a bridge to uh, solve problems. Um, now we are in touch with the University of Granada and Professor Francisco Lievana Cabanillas is starting uh, a research on financial exclusion of the elderly. And there he is doing a very deep, deep um, uh, 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 um, statistica, um, how do you say, uh, questions to uh, big, uh, importantly, statistical groups of what is happening to the elderly within their accessibility to digital uh, finances and uh, especially finances, because that is the best, the worst part of it. Um, we call it marketplace here in our title. And really most of the population, elderly population, uh, really just wants to put their money in, take it out and to see how their bills are being paid. So it's not even a marketplace for most, most of the people. And then um, they won't use other services that are getting more and more sophisticated instead of taking care of the ones that are. Uh, 
there's a lack of competition. There used to be institutions like saving banks that were uh, public in a way, and they guaranteed um, um, uh, uh, to attend the people, but they were taken away some years ago. Now all bank is private, so you can't choose because they're all doing the same type of, of activity. So that's another thing we need, a public bank that would really take care of the citizens and would be moved by different motivations. Uh, then we are also uh, kept away from using cash. And uh, when we know that um, uh, plastic money, that credit cards or debit cards really are expensive to keep, and they also uh, are um, threaten our privacy uh, and it, it adds expenses. I think that is, this has been especially hard on rural uh, population, where that is been, being now absolutely impossible. So, um, one of the points that we see that we have lost is the um, CSR in the financial system and bank system. In 2004, we founded the CSR Observatory with other 15 organizations, and it was fantastic how they all went into the global compact spirit, and there we talked about the accountability, and there was a communication between consumers and all the actors, let's say, around any type of company. Well, that has gone away after the crisis in the 2007 and 8. CSR disappeared and there is no accountability and no social view and not even um, uh, environmental view isn't as strong as it was then. They didn't have to tell us what to do. We don't have, consumers organizations don't have uh, enough strength. The asymmetry between our resources and the ones of the firms or banks or whatever is, is enormous. I mean, we, we can't really reach the people. We can't really um, find out what is really going on. So, and there's another thing that political uh, parties are financed by the banks. So they are not really, really hard on them. There's a, at least there's a suspicion in, the, um, in, in, in this, but our strength is in information. And to reach the people and to have everyone informed is complicated. What we do in Theku is network. We sit with all type of organizations. We sit with trade unions, with parliamentary groups, with other organizations, with politicians and with firms. And that's how we do our lobby work. And it's looking at the people's face. At the end, we're talking about another world absolutely different of the digital world. In this presential or physical world, when we look at the other person's eyes, we can agree and we can get to points where we find out, we see that behind someone who is uh, representing an institution, a financial institution, there's a person that really understands that it's different to be an elderly person if you're alone or if you have a grandson or a granddaughter. That makes the difference now. And so uh, we know, we think that uh, we all have to learn to reach agreements, looking for the common grounds, what we have in common. They need us. We are their clients, whatever age or activity we have. And so in this win-win concept that was uh, that is so talked about in the companies and firms and so ever, win-win has to include consumers. We have to act as if we were doctors. We have to uh, listen to consumers. We have to um, hear about their symptoms. We have to analyze what's going on. And then we have to di diagnose what is uh, going wrong. And then with all this networking and with all these groups that want to do things better, we have to start constructing a different world because what's really important is that no one can be left behind. We are now in 2022, and I think that's the real message. No one can be left behind. <laughs>
Thank you very much, Anna. This is a great uh, appeal also, uh, your, your last words. So please join me in thanking all the panelists for their um, opening interventions. And uh, we would like to pick up a few aspects and discuss them a bit further. And I have seen that there are already questions in the FAQ section um, of our Zoom system. So maybe Consumers International colleagues, it would be nice if you could try to unmute the first colleague so that he can ask the question directly and live. It's a bit nicer maybe then if I ask it, uh, yeah, if I read it out. And so the first comes from Michael Mungoma, I think it's from Kenya. And if that is possible um, to hear Michael, that would be great so that Michael can ask his questions directly. And maybe you could specify who of the three panelists you would like to address your question. And to my panelists, please keep it as concise as possible. Do we have Michael? Can we hear Michael? Okay, maybe if that is not the case, I see that there may be a technical glitch. That is not a huge problem. Then Michael, sorry, but you typed it in. I will read it out for you then. So Michael is asking, how can civil societies, especially in middle and low income countries, effectively ensure that governments provide safety among consumers? And maybe I'd ask some of the speakers here on the panel that have some insights drawn from different countries. Maybe Matt, is there, do you have any, any clues for Michael? Sure, yeah, I'm, I'm happy to, to share a bit. Um, so some of the, the very effective ways that, that civil societies can help to provide insights to regulators or to governments um, are through things such as um, consumer panels that uh, provide input at regular times or in response uh, to particular uh, legislative or, or regulatory proposals. Uh, that an authority might might be considering. Um, and I know that those are not always in place in, in every country, um, but that's one opportunity to ensure that this input um, is um, institutionalized, so to speak, so that it's not just a one-off uh, response. But I'll, I'll stop there. So I see Anna has well, I'd like to tell Michael that we don't have to invent anything. Just take a look all over the world. We have Consumers International as a, a point, a place to look for, to see what has been done in other places. And maybe start with some example that has worked. Thank you both for that contribution. And I think there is another question that I see here in the chat, not in the question and answer section, that relates a little bit to that same question. Um, I read here, what barriers do you see to the development of policies that protect vulnerable consumers in digital finance? And maybe, Anna, I would ask you to give a few hints from your work what kind of barriers there are to actually develop those policies. You've already mentioned a few, um, the conflict of interest that there may be with banks or other financial institutions, but maybe you can name one or two, two others. Well, in, in any case, I think we have to use properly uh, democracy. We have to insist in uh, getting in touch with our uh, politicians with our representatives, when there are elections, we have to sit with them a, a, quite a time before elections come, telling them what is going on. We have to ask our fellow consumers, um, friends, uh, different ages, different um, uh, ambits, and tell them this is going on. We have to go with data and with information and look at them at the eyes. I insist a lot in personal communication. 
And I think use democracy, that's the best tool we have. Thank you, Anna. I have another question. I'll try to take as many as, as we can because that's the purpose also to exchange here on this session. There's a question by Felicia Monnier, um, if I'm not completely mistaken, from Nigeria. And she writes, given the different aspects of vulnerability identified in today's papers, are there common grounds or principles that can be adopted by financial institutions to help the affected consumers? I think that reads like a question to you, Martin. Um, so have you identified in your work common grounds or common principles that could be adopted across the board, also maybe globally? Yeah, I think two things come to mind. Um, the first is about inclusion. So um, one of the questions that we were discussing prior to this event was, you know, how many of us are vulnerable or potentially vulnerable? And I think the answer to that is, well, we all are. So the first principle is that vulnerability shouldn't be about what is measurable now, but what could happen in the future. So firms should be able to anticipate their customers' needs going forward. And that echoes what Anna was saying about understanding customers' needs and building solutions, products, services, distribution channels that meet those needs. So I think it's, it's anticipating what could happen is really important. And that seems to echo in Matt's research and the basis of the FCA. I think the other principle as well is that it needs to be enforced because what we've seen through the history of um, the regulator in the UK through trial and error, they've found that say treating customers fairly, which I mentioned earlier, which started in 2006, that was not quite soft regulation, but it was an ask to the industry to regulate themselves properly. And what we found was that, well, that didn't quite happen. Um, boards of big banks have shareholders. There are other things to focus on. So I think um, any framework to protect customers, not just vulnerable customers, but any customer, needs to have a strong regulator with teeth. So they're my two main principles, I think. Before I take Anna, and I saw your hand. I'll give you the floor in a second. Um, I would like to take, it's more a demand, I think, than a real question that we have here, but I think it's really important. It comes from Indonesia. Let me read it out to you. So first, it's great insights in this session. So the, the question comes from Nukolis Nukolis. I hope I pronounced this halfway right. Apologies if not. I want to know if there are any written material and articles, for example, from those speakers, because I want to read more explanation. In my experience in Indonesia, the governing body always talks about literacy, but not much on this kind of vulnerability. They don't give enough attention to the consumer, instead accusing the consumer of lack of literacy. And this is more a question to the panelists. Maybe we could put together, you could pull from your experience, from your research, a few key studies also that those that you have produced yourself maybe we could send them around at the end of the session as a follow-up after this week so that the the participants also have a little bit of material that they can point their own governments towards or their own policy makers i think that would be a great outcome here if we could pull something a little bit together Anna, I have not forgotten about you. The floor is yours. No, that uh, about common grounds and principles. I think that there's an important point that's the language we, we use and how we try to reach the people. If each group is very different. And this is very important to have a simple language and make things that are really accessible and understandable. Excellent. Thank you, Anna. I see. Another question I think that is very important here in the context of what we're discussing. Um, for me, it is displayed by an, anon an anonymous um, participant and it reads, is the concept of vulnerability similar across digital and offline contexts or are there any nuanced differences? So, I think, Matt, Martin, that calls maybe on your expertise first. 
I'll, I can only share with you what I know through how the FCA look at this. As, and I think from conversations with colleagues around the world, I think the FCA are at the forefront of really kind of defining the framework. I would say that from what I've heard from the FCA, their guidance is channel agnostic. So regardless of which channel, the same considerations need to be taken into account. But I think it would be naive to think that, say, a digital only brand that had just launched should have the, um, the availability for non-digital customers. And I think that's the challenge, as I said in my, the end of my, my, my presentation. It's something that we're starting to see come through now because we're seeing, as Anna was pointing out, the traditional banks starting to close branches and they're replacing them with digital solutions. That's, that's a conundrum. And it's something that the regulator has to tackle, how you can keep the human in a traditional banking relationship that probably you've had for 30, 40, 50 years in some cases, and all of a sudden the access to a human is turned off. That is a huge challenge. But generally the principles of um, vulnerability apply across all channels. Thank you, Martin. Matt, do you yeah. have something to add, please? Jump in on that. Um, I, I agree with everything that Martin said. And I think um, that, again, it comes down to sort of these different interactions of personal characteristics and, in this case, delivery channel characteristics or product characteristics. Um, so going back to what Anna was speaking about, about um, when she was mentioning elderly populations, for example. So in an analog context, um, older uh, customers might be considered at risk of vulnerability um, for a variety of reasons. Um, perhaps uh, in, uh, challenges about making decisions on their own, for example. Um, but then in a digital context, then those um, interactions become perhaps stronger and there are additional vulnerabilities that arise because of a lack of familiarity with digital technology or because of a lack of access um, and, uh, and, and yeah, lack of familiarity. So I think that then it, the principles should be the same, but then in terms of what are the policy responses and how do we actually address those vulnerabilities, I think that, that then it becomes uh, more nuanced as, as the person asked. Thank you. Yes, so it's mutually reinforcing in a way. I think we would have time for one more question, but I also see, I think, a great comment in the chat that is coming from South Korea. Um, don't know if you've all seen it, but it reads, policymakers and authorities in Korea tend to focus on the elderly, poor and young when discussing financial vulnerability and shape most policies for those consumers. However, con Korean consumer advocacy groups are arguing that anyone can be vulnerable. And that's a little bit also what the European Commission already said in 2016. Um, so the colleague highlights, I like the OECD and FCA's nuanced framework where vulnerability is defined as a more fluid or dynamic. So I think that calls again for sharing some of the resources that can, can be used in other parts of the world. And there are also resources being shared about Canada, just to highlight that. Sorry, Matt, please. No, no, I'm sorry for interrupting. I was just going to say that I appreciate this comment. And I think that one of the ways that obviously vulnerability is, is getting a lot of attention right now, and there's a lot of discussion about it. Um, and I think that that's fantastic. And I think that one of the potential uh, effects of this will be that the more we recognize that we are all potentially vulnerable, um, then it kind of ultimately underscores the importance of a strong financial consumer protection framework itself for everyone. So yes, on the one hand, of course, there are certain characteristics or certain populations that might be at risk, and there needs to be a framework that's developed to address those particular risks and the ways that those interactions happen um, to produce vulnerability. But at the same time, recognizing, for example, through COVID, that anyone can become vulnerable, ultimately what that means is that governments, regulators, um, legislators may need to ensure that there is a, a robust financial consumer protection framework that is in place and that is enforced, as, as my other panelists had mentioned. Mm -hmm. 
Indeed, thank you, Matt. That is also from a consumer advocacy point of view, really worth highlighting. Anna, I see your hand up. Well, I think that if something is accessible, it's logic, it's friendly, it's accessible, logic and friendly for everyone. It doesn't mean that the bright ones are left out. I mean, if, if, uh, once I was, I, I said in a building, this building isn't accessible. And the architect said, yes, there's a door there on the side. And I said, no, something is accessible when everyone goes in through the same door. And that's what we're asking for. There's one door and anyone get in can get in through that unique door. It has to be normal. I think it's a problem of the people who design uh, programs, uh, applications, uh, interfaces, uh, etc. I mean, they don't look for our needs and they don't think on what all the processes we have to go through. Thank you. Thank you, Anna. Thank you to everyone, particularly Matt and Martin, uh, to the three panelists for all your very valuable contributions. I think there are a few key takeaways from, of course, our perspective as an organization, if I may, we have really come to the conclusion just like Anna said, it's important that the framework is right. If you just put the burden on the individual consumer and at the same time putting also the burden at the financial institutions to check the potential vulnerability of every individual consumer, you'll never get there. It's a lot of burden, but instead try to apply what Anna was saying, create a framework that works for everyone. In our experience here in Europe, that's been a really tough one. Even after the financial crisis, we've not been able to really push it through. So I wish all the colleagues that work on advocacy in their regions, good luck for them. But what is encouraging is that defining vulnerability is actually a challenge that policymakers and regulators are dealing with globally and picking up more in some regions than in others, but we can all learn from each other. And maybe we should not focus on the definition only. What is probably also useful, and we've learned that today, is that some successful approaches exist already to track vulnerability, and it's being rolled out in different areas. And industry needs to measure the consumer outcomes. I think that is something that, as consumer groups, we can then also use to show progress or lack of progress. So here consumer advocacy plays an important role in protecting those who are vulnerable and to help inform policymakers and industry, both of them. That is my takeaway from today. I hope everyone had their own takeaways. We will follow up with a few resources shared by our experts. If you want to know more, of course, not only about Consumer International's work, but also the members' work, uh, upcoming events, and so on and so forth, here are the ways how you can do it. Follow us on Twitter, LinkedIn, Instagram, Facebook, whatever is most convenient for you. Thank you very much for attending today's session. Have a look at the program. There are more sessions tomorrow. And stay tuned. Thank you very much.